The Ontario Trillium Foundation has contracted the Tamarack Institute to help build the collective impact capacity both within the Ontario Trillium Foundation grantees as well in the community. Thea Silver is on the call today to talk a little bit more about the collective impact stream. Pass it over to you, Thea. Thanks a lot, Heather, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as Heather said, my name is Thea Silver and I'm with the Ontario Trillium Foundation. I'm the strategy lead for our Green People Action Area, which is essentially our granting into the environment. Uh, and I just wanted to give a quick overview of OTF and our support for collective impact. I know we've got folks on the line from all over the place. Some will be familiar and some won't be, but I'll just uh, try to keep this fairly brief. Um, the Ontario Trillium Foundation is an agency of the Government of Ontario and our mission is to build healthy, vibrant communities throughout Ontario. And we do that largely through investing in community-based initiatives and the capacity of the voluntary sector to build healthy, vibrant communities. Um, we invest in about a thousand organizations or initiatives per year and we're one of Canada's largest granting foundations. We award about $110 million per year. And really over the next decade, we're going to be investing a billion dollars into Ontario, all geared towards building healthy, vibrant communities. And our strategy, we, we went through a, a redesigned strategy about a year and a half or two years ago, is very focused on specific measurable impact in communities across the province. So it's a very outcome-based investment strategy in order to try to uh, realize our mission for Ontarians. Uh, can you just pop to the next slide, Heather? Thanks. And we know that we're, we're going to realize our mission by making investments in different ways. Uh, and those are granting streams that uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation has. We invest in sort of innovative new projects through our seed granting stream. We invest in scaling up proven approaches that work through our grow stream. We invest in sort of interest, priority infrastructure needs through our capital stream. But we also recognize that in order to build healthy, vibrant communities, we need to invest in systems change to address deep, complex issues that really require a collective, multi-pronged and long-term approach to address. And that's where our investment, and it's relatively new for us as a foundation, our investment in, through our collective in, impact stream comes in. And this is rare, really where we're trying to work in partnership with the nonprofit community and communities and other stakeholders to bring about fundamental change through collective action. Next slide. Now I know Heather, Heather gave a number of questions just to get an idea of, of who's on the phone. If you don't mind, I'm going to do one more. And I'm just curious for the folks on the phone, who may be a recipient of OTF funding right now? Who is a grantee? And if you could just indicate sort of where that support has come from, that would be uh, helpful to us. Okay, so it looks like majority are not a grantee. Um, about 18% are grantee from uh, a different stream, and mm -hmm. we have about 7% who are a collective impact grantee. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's just uh, go to the next slide. So OTF has a relatively new granting stream. I like to call it an investment stream where we are supporting collective impact. And as a foundation, we recognize that collective impact takes time and we need to invest in the development of this work if we're really going to achieve success. So we have developed a model of support that includes funding in three stages. The first stage is sort of an early formative stage that we've called define the impact. We then have the ability to invest in sort of a deeper planning stage that we've called organize for impact. And finally, we have the ability to make a deeper long-term investment in implementation in a phase that we call deliver for uh, deliver impact. And I'll just spend a, f a couple minutes speaking to each of these uh, separately. This next, thank you. So stage one, we've called define the impact. And in some ways, this is sort of an early exploration and definition phase. 
We have the ability to provide up to $30,000 for up to 18 months. And really, in this, um, in this phase, phase, generally, there's already a group of stakeholders that have identified an issue, and there's some evidence of the problem, but there's still a lot to figure out. It's, a very, it's sort of an early formative stage, and this, stage, this sort of phase provides the support to do so. It often involves stakeholder, bringing stakeholders together to really identify and define the complex issue you are addressing, to start to develop a, th a theory of change, not to have it fully baked, but to start in that sort of formulation uh, phase, to solidify the collaborative a bit and start to bring stakeholders together, but also to identify who needs to be involved and isn't already involved. This stage can also involve sort of building a stronger uh, case for change. It could have further research, mapping the system, et cetera. And we recognize actually that sometimes it will take even longer to get sort of the ducks in a row than what we've provided here. We, we've had people, we've had groups come back for sort of stage 1B because they're not quite ready to move on to the next stage that I'm about to define. So this allows that real early convening research solidifying the issue to take place. With that done, we support what we've called Organize for Impact, which is a deeper planning sort of nuts and bolts stage. Coming out of stage one, hopefully there's a clear articulation and a common understanding of the issue you want and the change you want to see. There's compelling evidence. There's a critical mass of stakeholders and a bit of a structured leadership in place. But now you need to go deeper to build out that comprehensive plan. This phase allows for funding of up to $75,000 a year for up to two years and will involve, for example, building out you know, a really comprehensive theory of change, ensuring that all of the necessary cross-sectoral partners are engaged, creating a solid governance model and backbone infrastructure to support the collective, um, developing a shared measurement system, a very clear evaluation plan, a communication plan, um, and even you know sort of identifying the critical resources needs that are going to be necessary in order to really move the initiative to fruition. So this is sort of a much deeper comprehensive planning phase. And then finally with that done, OTF has the ability to invest in much deeper, longer-term uh, implementation because we know that comp you know, moving the bar on a complex issue is going to take years and it's messy. Um, so really once that planning's done, and we know that work still goes on uh, on the ground during those phases, but once it pulls together, we have the ability to invest up to about half a million or $500,000 per year for up to five years, and that's just net of any previously funded components. Um, to be honest, rarely at this phase, and we have not, this is fairly new to us, we don't have any initiatives in this phase yet, some are getting close. Um, rarely will we be the only funder at the table. The, the issues that are warranting this kind of investment are deep and of interest to all different folks and, and will require a deeper investment really to allow that systems change to take place. And in this phase, you're really delivering on your theory of change, adapting and iterating as you go. We know that there is sort of a constant learning and adaptation that's going to be necessary to achieve success uh, over the long term. Next slide. Oh, Heather, thanks. Um, this slide, uh, I think they call them wordles is really just to give an idea of the breadth of, itch, of issues in which we as a foundation are currently investing through our collective impact stream. As I said before, all of these are in that early sort of stage one or stage two uh, phase. In fact, we actually require the latest you can come into our funding is, is through stage two. Um, but some are now moving towards that implementation. And all of these issues, and this is not uh, exclusive uh, by any stretch, there could be others that we're investing in, but all of them are aligned with our strategy and the priorities we as a foundation want to achieve as we build healthy, vibrant communities. This final slide. So if you're interested in learning more, I just wanted to give some contact information. 
Um, we'd invite you, and we've got a lot more information online as well, I'd invite you to visit our webpage. The web address is up on your screen. Or you can contact our support center, and the numbers are there in front of you, or email otf at otf.ca. Or for those that are in Ontario and familiar with, uh, with our foundation, you can always contact our local program manager as well to start a discussion about your initiative. And unlike our other streams where applicants can, you know, can just kind of go online and apply, our investment in collective impact is much more of a dialogue. It starts with a conversation and we really see ourselves as, as partners supporting the work. Uh, so we'd invite you to uh, start that conversation uh, with us and please get in touch. So I think that's all I need to go over right now. So I'll hand it uh, back over to uh, Tamarack. Thanks, Thea. Um, now I have the pleasure to introduce you to Sylvia. Sylvia is passionate about community engagement and the unique role that citizens play in creating dynamic and well-connected neighborhoods and community. Sylvia leads the Deepening Community Practice Area at Tamarack, and she is internationally recognized trainer and community builder whose work is focused on the fields of, collective, of collaborative leadership, collective impact, and community engagement. Over to you, Sylvia. Hi, thanks Heather, thanks everyone for making the time to join us today. So the focus of today's webinar is really looking at that question about how do we build sustainability into our collective impact effort and what I really love about uh, Thea, your overview around the, the collective impact granting stream that Trillium has put forward is a real appreciation and recognition. When we think about sustainability, very often we leap right to, well, how does this work get funded? And that's a really important piece and I think really helps to appreciate the innovation of creating a collective impact grant stream, recognizing that there is there are financial resources needed to explore working in this way. So, um, but I also want to acknowledge that when I'm thinking about um, what it takes to build sustainability into the effort. I'm using um, uh, an understanding or an appreciation and curiosity about sustainability that goes beyond solely looking at the resources and also really wanting to encourage people when you're thinking about sustainability to think about, you know, um, the evolution of your concept idea and thinking. It's also the engagement ongoingly of people who are involved in the work. and. What I want to do is really root this in some of the learning um, from some early collective impact efforts, recognizing that there are five kind of distinct phases that collective impact tends to unfold around. And there are three tools that I have sort of pulled out that I want to really highlight for you as useful frameworks to help you assess and think about building intentional sustainability into your collective work. Um, in the scope of time we have today, I'm going to go quickly over two of the three tools and really focus our energy in on one of the three in more depth. But we will follow up the call and webinar with resources in all three. And, you know, there's always a uh, lot of opportunity to send in your questions and also share your own insights and learning. Um, in any one of these tools. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a frame for how I want to tackle our time together on the webinar. If I can get you to go to the next slide, Heather, that would be great. Um, so for me, I, I mean, uh, there's a poll that I'm curious about. So for those of you um, who follow the work of the Collective Impact Forum and the folks at FSG, you know, the kind of the field is really acknowledging this work tends to unfold over the course of five phases. Assessing readiness would be the first, which is really, you know, testing the waters, building the alliances and the partnerships kind of beginning to articulate what the it is that you might be working on together. Initiating action would be that second phase, so really starting to give voice to and articulate what your shared plan of action and common agenda might involve and look like. Organizing for impact is when you're really kind of starting to build plans and moving those pieces forward. Beginning implementation is really about starting to actually do the work 
um, and letting it unfold in early stage. And then the fifth stage, sustaining action and impact, is continuing that work forward, but also continuing to critically analyze, reflect, and refine your approach um, on an ongoing basis. So with that as a bit of a context, where would you place yourself in terms of the work you are doing in collective impact? So, Sylvia, it looks like um, about half of the group is assessing readiness. Okay. 23% 23 is initiating action. 13% is organizing for impact. 13% um, is sustaining action. And 9% is beginning implementation. Fabulous. Thanks, folks. So for me, you know, really thinking about the work, um, I think you thinking about the phases, particularly in the early stage, and really paying attention to those preconditions of collective impact. These three are factors, the influential champions, engaging them meaningfully, refining and articulating the issue and you know the data and urgency around it and securing the kind of resources you need to do this collaborative work that is a large part of that early uh, getting ready uh, stage and I think there's not necessarily been as much written about these um, three preconditions but you know from Tamarack's perspective and we've you know through our experience with the Vibrant Communities Network um, and building um, collaborative roundtables, working with diverse sectors. We know this community engagement work is critical to putting a, a good root system to sustain a collaborative effort over time. Next slide, please. So again, um, if people are here just sort of exploring this whole concept of collective impact, in addition to articulating three preconditions, um, the initiators of the collective impact uh, framework, our colleagues at FSG, uh, Social Impact Consultants, also articulated five conditions of collective impact. I'm not going to go over those now, but just want to root us in you know, that work. From our own experience at Tamarack and the work of our communities, one of the things that we really um, have come to appreciate is that it's most helpful to think about how this work unfolds in windows of no more than three to five years. Because really, the world changes so much and so quickly around us. And as we start to engage the system and implement our collective impact effort, you know, that's going to generate shifts and changes in the system as well, which we need to be able to adapt and plan for. And so you know, that horizon of three to five years is, is really helpful. Um, some of the other learnings we've had, thinking around this from more of a systemic um, and adaptive lens, is that the kinds of leaders that are needed at a, at a collective impact table will vary, shift, and change depending on the maturity of your effort. That this learning and reflection component needs to be critically and intentionally woven into the work plans of a collective impact effort at every phase. But we really do draw from um, this eco-cycle framework, which is one of the tools I'll be introducing in a little bit, because we found, like nature, it's a useful way to think about this work unfolding over time. And what we know from that is that there are critical traps at each phase as you try to navigate from one phase to another. And so being intentional about knowing what those traps are and navigating them is a critical component of looking at renewal and sustainability in your effort. So what is really useful about this chart, which came to us from the folks at FSG and has actually gone through a couple of iterations as well, is really an acknowledgement that there are four kind of structural components that need to be intentionally thought about in the design of an effective collective impact effort. So governance and infrastructure, the strategic planning, community engagement, and evaluation and improvement, or I would also say learning. Those are always present, but what you're paying attention to and what the work involves for each one of those components will shift and change as your effort matures. 
in many ways, when I was listening to you, Thea, kind of go over the three investment streams within OTS, OT, OTS collective impact granting um, cycle, what I thought was really interesting is in many ways, you know, phase one and phase two here really is sort of what can get covered through your defining of impact stage. Um, you know, phase three and phase four, even a little bit, could be your organizing for impact and delivering impact is absolutely, you know, part of phase four and phase five here, I would say. Just to kind of make sense of how those two things align. Could we go to the next slide? So here are three tools. And because I know that there are many of you on the call who are mature practitioners, I'd welcome folks to chime in and share other useful tools and frameworks from your own experience as well. But the three that I want to touch on, the first is called a framework for change. The second is called the eco-cycle mapping tool. Sometimes it's also called the adaptive cycle. And the third tool is something um, that we've put together called the Collective Impact Self-Assessment Tool. And the one, uh, so if we can go to the next slide, Heather. So for those of you that particularly that are in the early stage of your collective impact effort or assessing readiness, one of the really important um, tools and tasks that the group needs to focus on fairly early on is trying to articulate what your framework for change is. And for us, the intent of a framework for change is on one page, visually if we can, what we're trying to do is name four people, what is your collaborative group's shared working hypothesis for how you intend to achieve your common agenda given the complex issue that you're working on together. So what's really important and the reason why from our perspective taking the time to articulate a framework for change is valuable and important is what it does is it enables your group from diverse perspectives to come together and begin to create a bit of a shared articulation of two things, both your um, collective understanding of the issue in its current reality in your community and also begin to frame for folks what your proposed approach for change is. Oftentimes what we find is and where the real work is in creating a framework for change is around translating what is implicit that each one of us kind of just believes and assumes and doing the, conver the iterative conversations amongst you to make that kind of understanding explicit and documented. Moving from the fragmented understanding or involvement on a particular issue that individual players bring to the table to co-creating amongst yourselves a shared um, kind of articulation of both the current issue and the opportunity um, amongst yourselves for yourselves but also for your broader community of stakeholders. And that ultimately what you're trying to do is demonstrate how by working together and evolving your understanding of this issue, you are planning to um, bring forward increasingly plausible, doable, testable actions to affect positive change. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So really, when you kind of while as much of the framework is an articulation of the group's common agenda, it also gives you an opportunity to begin to illustrate uh, what your current understanding is of those mutually reinforcing activities that you know, you're hoping to align through your collective impact effort. And one of the reasons why it's really important to try and capture this visually is that that can be a really compelling way to both test for alignment amongst your core stakeholders and really allow you to take your shared thinking out to a broader community and continue your ongoing engagement. One of the big questions though that often comes up, for, particularly for those of you working in the nonprofit sector, is well, aren't frameworks for change just logic models? Aren't they the same or are they different? And for me, they're not profoundly different, but they're subtly different. Because for me, a logic model presumes 
that we already know what the answer is and it just lays out clearly the steps that we intend to follow to implement a program um, to address a known problem. What is slightly different around a framework for change is we are saying implicitly we're not sure. Here's our best guess for now. And you'll see, um, you know, there's a, a place where the group is clearly articulating here are some options, here is some of our thinking about what we think is going to make a difference, and here's how and why we're framing this the way we're framing this. That is a subtle difference, but making that explicit is important not only for the community to be able to kind of say, well, what about this, what about that? but also from an ongoing learning perspective, the leaders of your collaborative effort from a sustainability place can come back after you begin experimenting with shared work and really ask yourself, is this working? Are, are some of our assumptions, given what we're now learning about the problem as we've engaged in some work together, do we now have a richer understanding? Are we now starting to shift our perspective of what we think it's going to take to make lasting systems change around this complex issue? So some of the benefits. For your leadership group, from a sustainability point of view, it really pushes folks to work hard, to concentrate on what's most important. It really allows people from different perspectives to sort of see how they're contributing to the effort. You'll see here in the picture on the side of this slide, you know, naming an aspiration, which is sort of more um, uh, positive and challenging um, then just sort of this is the problem we want to fix is often a very important component of how you articulate this. And it really kind of gives people a chance to make the assumptions around what it's going to take to address the complex issue visible um, for folks to see. For leaders of a collective impact effort, it really is a, a succinct way of conveying to stakeholders um, and from a sustainability point of view, for engaging other perspectives, it helps to make that strategic thinking clear. It helps to make others aware of some of the explicit decisions and choices that a collective impact effort is making as it tries to tackle a complex issue in the community. It really helps the group as a leadership group um, come back and revisit its own decision making and what we might want to challenge around our own thinking as we learn more. So it's useful as an evaluation and learning frame. It's also, I think, a really powerful way to assess progress and from a sustainability lens, makes it much easier to welcome new leadership energy to a collective impact table because it sort of succinctly captures the group's thinking. Um, and that's another important consideration. On to the next slide. For others in the community, it becomes a very accessible document, so people may not formally enroll themselves as part of the collective impact effort, but if they believe in uh, the aspiration of your group, they can still do work that contributes positively to advancing that agenda. It also is a, a beautiful articulation that's accessible regardless of age, regardless of people's literacy levels, and be, can become a really important resource for sponsors and researchers and evaluators to help kind of map not just what you're trying to do, but what your understanding is about what's important around how you do that. This next tool um, is often referred to as the EcoCycle Planning Tool. Other, other times, it's, uh, people may have heard of it as the Adaptive Cycle. And this is the one that I really want to spend some focused time on because it really helps you understand quickly and visually sort of the whole three to five year pathway that you can anticipate your collective work as unfolding around. Interestingly, it can also apply to you from your own individual organizational context, can also um, help maybe understand where the community as a whole is at with respect to an issue. So you can take this tool and use it to map um, an organization, a department, um, a collaborative effort, and the community as a whole. If you can go to the next slide. 
So I'm just going to walk you through what this says. Um, if, oh, sorry, I my mistake. If you can just go back. Um, I'll, what you'll see, we usually start thinking about this frame right in the bottom right-hand corner around creative destruction. This uh, creative destruction is often sometimes thought of as um, also the renewal part of um, a thinking journey. Most of us are sort of more familiar with, you know, sort of that performance loop where we, uh, starting in the developmental quadrant in the bottom left, we have a new idea as an organization or as a collaborative, we implement that new idea and it goes up the curve and it becomes mature and successful. We keep that one running, maybe we start another one and we um, kind of bring that new initiative to fruition and we move that forward up through maturity. What begins, the, but what's interesting is we rarely, rarely look at the back loop. So sort of from what happens when your mature initiative stop being as impactful or the, the context of your community changes and so some of the ideas that have often worked well in the past aren't working now, that's when you start to see an opportunity for pause, for stepping back. Often a collective impact effort will start because a number of stakeholders have come together get recognizing that the programs and services that they've put in place to address this issue just aren't getting the job done. So, you know, and there's lots of crisis, there's lots of breakdown and a real opportunity um, to sort of seed something new, to kind of really look at exploring doing things differently. So that brings you sort of up the curve to the top left-hand part of the cycle. And this is the exploration phase, is the phase where what's starting to happen is people are brainstorming all kinds of great ideas. They are prototyping some possibilities. They're reading about new ideas. They're thinking about things. This would sort of be the maybe perhaps the startup of a collective impact effort, building momentum, curiosity. And then over time, ideally what starts to happen is the brainstorming stops and we say, okay, like we can't possibly do all of these ideas all at once. What we really need to do is zero in, focus on one or two places where we're going to start our work and get busy doing that work and begin sort of uh, generating results, starting to see if we can make a difference, starting to test and refine some chosen ideas. Over time, what tends to happen is some of these things we see will be working well. Some of them will be working less well, and we need to sort of um, let them go. The ones that are working well, we might say, hmm, so we've worked this idea collaborative, uh, this initiative well in three neighborhoods in our community. Maybe we need to scale it up to five or six or eight or ten. And so it's really about how do we take the learning from operating this program, increase its efficiency, increase its effectiveness, and really kind of scale it up and grow. And then, again, we pause, we reflect, we let go of the things that aren't working, or, you know, we reassess what the needs are in the community, and we need to sort of let things, uh, new ideas begin to percolate. If we can go to the next slide. So one of the ways in which we found it's really useful to begin um, exploring and using this framework is to invite people to map where maybe they are individually, where their organization is in its own sort of journey around this cycle, where our collaborative is on a cycle. Um, and that can be a really important source of rich dialogue, particularly if, for example, you start to see that there are newer people in your collaborative who um, may kind of assess that, you know, really we thought we were in exploration, but, you know, some of the people that have been around for a while say, no, 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 we're in a different place. So really helping to kind of build that shared assessment of where your initiative is at and where it is likely to head, you know, what's going to be called on you as a group of leaders next to think about in um, bringing your collaborative to life. Go to the next slide. 
I think one of the other most useful things that we found about using this cycle is that w there have been through research some very predictable traps that have been identified as m preventing groups from moving from one phase of this cycle to another. And knowing what those are and being able to name them, I think, can be useful and helpful if you're feeling like your collaborative effort is stuck. And from a sustainability point of view, you really want to challenge how you can move yourself out. So let me just talk about what some of those are. So if you imagine um, the chronic disaster trap. So what's happening is um, you're trying lots of different ideas, things are spinning, nothing seems to be moving. Um, one of the things that's happening is that might suggest from some of the work that's been done around what's going on to that phase, the trust between some of the players may not be as strong as it needs to be. There may be so many ideas but none of them as compelling as it needs to be to kind of move people passionately up into a phase of exploration and brainstorming around actions. This is one of those places where having a strong aspiration that inspires not just people's heads but their hearts can be a really important piece of from moving you out of the creative destruction phase and into the exploration phase. The exploration phase then moving in from that brainstorming piece to uh, into a developmental phase, the trap that often catches people in the evolution of their work together is what's called the scarcity trap. I know when I was sort of leading a collaborative in my own community, we had done more than a year of kind of envisioning with different groups and building consensus. We had actually come to a place of generating six to eight ideas that had strong community support to advance forward. And the scarcity trap, how it showed up for us, was really recognizing we had pulled in to our collaborative effort a lot of powerful leaders in the community that were sector leaders. And the six ideas that had generated from a grassroots kind of community engagement uh, session may, meant that we were going to have, we couldn't implement all six at once. So whichever one or two we really chose to put our energy behind meant that we would lose some of the active and critical support from some of the sector leaders that um, we really valued and needed if we chose, if their kind of sector specific um, uh, priority wasn't one of the, the two that were immediately advanced. So how do we keep these people engaged even if the priority we're advancing isn't as tightly linked to their own organization? That's kind of where that scarcity trap kind of showed itself for us. And how we kind of moved ourselves past it was the recognition that if we don't choose one or two things and move from exploration into actually tangibly acting and moving an agenda and plan forward around one or two of these priorities, we were going to lose everybody anyway. The parasitic trap is something that often um, shows up when you're kind of transitioning from, you know, some initial success and planning into a place of maturity. So for many collaboratives, you know, you are often nested within an existing organization that's providing some structure, um, some infrastructure, some, some space even to advance your idea. As you start to get some real traction and perhaps funding behind your effort, you know, one of the tensions that might begin to show up is that you are actually becoming a bit of a parasite um, on the operations of your host organization. And so understanding and navigating that journey, is it time to move and, and be hosted somewhere else? That can be part of the conversation. Or, um, you know, the danger you want to stay away from, from a sustainability point of view, is you really don't want your collaborative work to form a net new competing organization. So it's really how do you navigate sort of your growth, your maturity, while not falling necessarily into a trap of creating yet another organization, um, but leveraging the resources of the partnership around the table. 
And then the final trap, the rigidity trap, really says after you've had a couple of really good successes, the community starts counting on your collaborative effort and collective impact work to continue to provide that. So what happens um, you know, when some of those effective initiatives are becoming less effective? Are you as a collaborative able to step back and say, well, maybe we need to change up um, you know, our approach to addressing this or that or the other thing? It could also be that there are new um, needs and um, changes in the community that to be effective, your collaborative needs to build into its evolving strategy and plan. So I just wanted to kind of give you that because it's a very good diagnostic. It's a good diagnostic for organizations and can sometimes create a compelling, um, a, a compelling uh, framework to invite conversation around the formation of a collective impact effort. It can also help you diagnose and anticipate what your collective impact effort is going to need over time. So that's the second tool. And if we can just go quickly, I will just highlight ever so, though, sorry folks, that's the, that's the um, a summary of the traps that I just reviewed for you visually. You know, one of the options, again, we we're not going to have time to do that, but, you know, using it as a reflective tool is something that we would highly engage, encourage. And here are some of the questions you can use to guide a reflection using that framework. The final tool I just want to touch on ever so briefly, for those of us that are sort of more linear, um, is this CI self-assessment tool, which we can absolutely share. And what it does, and when you really look at it, is depending on where you see yourself as a, in the evolutionary journey of your collective impact effort, it really kind of synthesizes and summarizes some of the key activities that are needed and then has a, an action planning element underneath it so you can begin to jot down sort of how do you take this rich learning and thinking about where you are and where you need to be and begin to action it across your collaborative effort. And that we will include a link to in the materials that we share with you. There you'll see. There's the sample. You know, here's where we assess ourselves to be um, and here's what we think we need to do to move that work forward. So just kind of in summary, um, when we think about the the sustainability of a collaborative effort over time, because you are continually needing to engage and involve multiple partners and um, build a collective effort from their individual activities, there's a constant flow of change that occurs both within the work of the collective impact effort and within the community that you're trying to operationalize your work in. You really need to use these kinds of frameworks and tools and build in time um, in your collective impact effort work to really do some of that reflecting, learning, pausing, um, and adapting of your strategy over time. And not to be afraid of that. On to the next slide. So again, here's some opportunities to go for additional resources. As I think we mentioned, Heather um, will follow up with copies of resources around these three tools in particular after today's call. But let's pause here and invite folks to um, put forward any comments, any questions, any insights. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so we do have a question. Uh, okay. When mapping collective impact, what is the difference between me and the organization? Um, the, it, it, the question was asked when you were talking about the eco mm. planning tool. Good. Um, so I think there's an assumption there. I really appreciate your question because it's pushing me to make explicit an assumption that I'm holding, which is, you know, typically, um, initiatives that are most resilient are the ones where you know you've got people and organizations engaged that are at different phases on their own journey in the cycle. So, um, for example, if I am, if I map me and I see myself sort of coming to the end of my professional career, 
so I'm kind of at the edge of that maturity um, phase and kind of moving into um, that sort of creative destruction new beginnings phase of the cycle, that might suggest this is a perfect person if they're willing and able to really pull into a strong leadership role in a collaborative effort, right? Because they're at a time of great change, you know, they may have um, an opportunity to provide more time and energy to the collaborative effort than they could. Uh, similarly, you know, um, some organizations that are more mature, you know, for an organization that's kind of stuck itself personally in the rigidity trap, there's an attractiveness, I think, sometimes, because the collaborative effort provides an opportunity for um, the, uh, the renewal and new possibilities that that organization is looking for. So understanding sort of where individually we're at and where the collaborative is at kind of helps us to say, well, what kinds of people do we need? What kinds of organizations might be attracted to this kind of work? I hope that answers your question. Okay, so we do actually don't have a lot of questions coming in. So I encourage you, if you do have a question, we'll be able to get to it. Um, the next question I have is actually for Thea. And it was, um, Nancy is wondering where, like, how, who do you contact um, at OTF? It used to be a program manager, and she's asking, is it your regional manager now to start the initiative? Uh, no, sorry. And it, I think if you go, if you are able to look back on the slide with the contact information, there's a few different avenues. You can call OTF's um, support center. And that number is uh, in Toronto, it's 416-963-4927, or um, outside of Toronto, it's 1-800-263-2887. Um, you can email us at otf.otf.ca. And for collective that, uh, impact, at least right now, when we're looking at roles, you still can start a dialogue with that with your local program manager. But if you're unsure, by all means, contact our support center, and they will route the uh, inquiry um, appropriately. All right, great. Um, I don't have any other questions. So, Sylvia, do you have any last thoughts? Well, not no last thoughts other than to say I'm here. Um, I know that at Tamarack we have lots of resources. I feel like you know, the um, EcoCycle tool is an incredibly valuable one, but it's a rich one. So if you start playing with it and, and have additional questions, don't be shy about reaching out. Um, and uh, we're happy to help. Okay. So, um, well, thank you very much, Sylvia. I know I, I learned a lot. Um, you had some really great questions that we should be asking ourselves when we're doing collective impact work. And you also had three great tools. And um, there are more tools out there that if you go to our website, um, you'll be able to find some more um, awesome tools. I just want to let you know that um, we have some more learning opportunities coming up. We have community engagement in Vancouver. We have um, a poverty reduction summit in Hamilton. We have two one-day workshops happening in London and in um, Regina. And we also have this, this webinar is actually going to be done again in uh, en Francais. And um, the webinar that we did two weeks ago is also going to be en Francais too. So I just want to say um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, coming to the webinar. We will be, in about a week or so, sending you the recording and the resources and um, anything else that I, I can find that might help you or that Sylvia might come across. So thank you very much and have a great afternoon.